Okay. Um, well, I will just, I will just like read my little introduction here. Okay. Hello, Plastic Pills listeners. This is Victor Brizzoni here again with Matt McManus, bringing you another politics focused microdose. This time the topic is Marx and liberalism and liberal rights. To help us in this discussion, we have Igor, and actually I just realized I probably should have asked you how to pronounce your last name before we did this, but do you want to give it, do you want to do it for me? Uh, Schoikenbrod would be probably the best, the most feasible. Schoikenbrod? Schoikenbrod. Schoikenbrod. Okay, thank God. <laughs> oh God, yeah, that's... that's Separate session on how to pronounce my last name. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Let's just keep that in. Okay. Yeah, uh, Igor received his PhD uh, in political science from the University of Toronto. And in fact, his supervisor, Peggy Cohn, is the same supervisor that I have currently have, right? It, it, your supervisor was Peggy. Yes, yeah. Peggy alongside Simone Chambers, who's now at uh, University of California, Irvine. Oh, right. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so Igor is also currently adjunct professor in the Ethics, Society and Law program at Trinity College in the University of Toronto. Um, and as, under, as I understand it, you're teaching a pretty inhumane number of classes right now. Four, did you say, or five? Yes. Uh, in addition to the Trinity College program, also, I have a lectureship appointment at UTM. Wow. Uh, yeah. So that's why there are many uh, courses uh, being taught by me this time around. And I hope and, the students are benefiting and not suffering from that. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, all on the computer. So you must sit, you sit in front of your screen, like all the time, I guess. These that's guys. right. That's right. All right. It's the, so uh, it's the zeitgeist. <laughs> yeah. Um, Igor recently published a very interesting book, Revisiting Marx's Critique of Liberalism, our own Matt McManus writing for Jacobin, called it an excellent book that deserves a large audience. Link in the description. <laughs> uh, you recently said, Igor, uh, that your book intentionally seeks to provoke liberals, Marxists, and critical theorists of all stripes to revisit established orthodoxies and assumptions, and that there has been a peculiar convergence of interpretations concerning Marx's supposed anti-law and anti-rights views across interpretive and political divides. Um, so yeah, this is... A uh, provocative goal, indeed. I think uh, in the online politics Twitter YouTube sphere that uh, we at Plastic Pills sometimes find ourselves in, there is certainly a strong tendency on both the right and especially the left to see Marxism as hostile to formal rights. You know, online leftists I think seem to see this as a sort of badge of honor, since rights and laws are just tools for the capitalist class to protect their private property or something dirty libs like maybe me and Matt latch onto. Uh, admittedly. My own hostility to Marxism tends to be related to the assertion that the state will wither away. The idea that this is desirable or a coherent goal I've always sort of had a problem with. Part of my objection to that, I think, is at times, um, at, at times like this, we find ourselves, uh, you know, institutions are being threatened, um, changing mo in reaction to changing moods and cultural shift. And it seems like strong institutions like rights and laws are useful for certain problems. And although I kind of hate the political spectrum or describing myself on the political spectrum, um, I suppose if pushed, I would place myself reluctantly somewhere like Rawls's liberal socialism. But now it sounds like your book is telling me that at least part of my aversion to Marxism is maybe based on a misunderstanding. Perhaps we could begin by having you tell us what that central misunderstanding is. Um, so yeah, Igor. Well, thanks, uh, Victor, for organizing this session and to Matt again for his uh, review in the Jacobin, which uh, is very well written and I think balanced and fair and has given me uh, an opportunity to also reflect on where I should uh, move forward in the sense that there obviously are loose ends, you know, in every, in every book. Uh, and so uh, I thank Matt for that. Um, uh, a lot of what you said, Victor, uh, resonates with the inspiration of the motivation for, for the book. In fact, uh, it first occurred to me uh, that this is a topic worth writing about after having a conversation with a, uh, another committee member of mine who uh, teaches in the law faculty, namely Alan Brudner. And this was a course I was taking with him, a terrific uh, course, which he used to teach and unfortunately no longer does, uh, called the Hegel's Political uh, Theory, the Political Thought of Hegel. And we read, of course, The Phenomenology of Spirit and, um, uh, and The Philosophy of Right. And might as well put in a plug uh, 
uh, for Alan's book called uh, The Owl and the Rooster, Hegel's Transformative Political <laughs> Science with Cambridge University Press. There's um, uh, the paperback edition, I think, just came out, so it's significantly cheaper. I'm mm -hmm. sure Alan will appreciate the plug, uh, if and when he does uh, uh, tune into this wonderful podcast. But uh, it basically, we were going through, you know, the typical uh, struggle <laughs> in this course. You get the vast majority of students either, you know, uh, really interested in Hegel or, uh, you know, the vast majority really interested in Marx <laughs> and uh, Mar Hegel's influence on Marx. And uh, I kept, you know, asking uh, Alan Brudner about, you know, the, some of the limitations of Hegel's approach, particularly in his discussion of civil society and ultimately of the state, the tension between civil society and the state. And it seemed as though Al Alan was getting increasingly tired of my questions and barrage. Mm -hmm. And he just, you know, front and said, and he said, Igor, but don't you want to have rights? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, what, mm -hmm. aren't you worried about the dictatorship of the proletariat? And then you have articulated it, Victor, in just using other words, effectively. Mm -hmm. And that got me thinking, got me thinking about the importance, right, of trying to come to grips with that challenge, a challenge that you hear you know, from honest liberals. I don't know about dirty liberals or whoever you identify. <laughs> uh, in that uh, there is a danger uh, right. with the concentration of political power in few, fewer hands when there are no institutional forms of mediation that constrain, uh, you know, the power of governments, right? And this is something that I think is very important to the liberal tradition, aside from its commitment to the at least formal uh, equality of, of individuals as bearers of rights. And uh, it really got me thinking uh, about this problem, uh, something that I took for granted at first, to be honest. I thought that this seems silly that, you know, Marx, Marx's social and political thought, uh, which is oriented towards the idea that the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all, wouldn't secure a place or a space for individual self-assertion uh, in the emancipated society of the future. But at that point in time, as a fourth year undergraduate student, you know, still trying to figure out what I want to do with my life. That's still the case, by the way. Uh, <laughs> although I'm not a fourth year undergraduate student, for the record, um, for our listeners. Uh, it really got me thinking about why I took it for granted that there would be such a sphere, a protected sphere, as liberals would put it, for individual self-assertion, and that it would take some institutional form, right, rather than un an unmediated right, uh, relation between individuals and this collective. Um, but I didn't have the evidence at the time, uh, and I didn't want to make it, you know, I, I didn't want to beg, beg the question, and I didn't want to start with the conclusion. I wanted to actually ask myself the question that Alan Brudner uh, posed to me, namely, don't, what is the value of rights, and is it, whether or not the rights discourse or rights talk is compatible with um, Marx's social and political thought. And in order to do that, I had to return to his really early writings, right? to track his sort of intellectual journey. And that brought me to his articles for the uh, uh, Reiner's Zeitung, which was a radical, you know, liberal, I would say, periodical. You have to understand in the context of the time, right, where the Prussian institutions were very much uh, in effect, right? And that region, Cologne, the Rhine, uh, Rhineland, actually, you know, as a consequence of the uh, Napoleonic uh, heritage, initially inherited some liberal reforms, but then they were sort of um, uh, undermined and ultimately there was the restoration of the Prussian state. And what you see in these early uh, writings, these articles for the um, Rheinisch Zeitung, is Marx taking seriously uh, the idea of law from the standpoint, I would argue, as I do in the book, of rational law. This interpretation of mine was actually influenced by another book that I had read uh, by Olufemi Taiwo called Legal Naturalism, a Marxist Theory of Law, which tries to show that, well, I mean, I disagree with his interpretation ultimately, but it tries to show that for Marx, every mode of production has its own nature, right? Uh, obviously, I, there's, a, there's an important disagreement that I have with Taiwo, but Taiwo does an excellent job showing why these early writings are so important. And what ended up happening in the Marxist tradition is they're typically ignored. This is the idealist Marx. This is the Marx who is still trying to come to grips with his own views. And I think that's a mistake. That's a mistake because we have to understand the context in which Marx is writing. And it was uh, with great intention that I chose as the cover image for my book, uh, you know, you, you have the, the Lady Justice, right, in mm -hmm. the woods, 
And it's not just some wacky idea. It actually, uh, it was inspired by Marx's famous article for the uh, Rheinisch Zeitung, The Law and the Thefts of Wood, or the Wood Theft Law, where Marx uh, basically takes issue with the transformation, if you will, in property relations such that wealthy uh, landowners, the forest owners, as he calls them, are able to use the state as a vehicle, not only for their own self-enrichment, but rather as a punitive um, uh, mechanism against the uh, impoverished peasants, right? Who would customarily, because of their situation, gather fallen forest wood, right? And so that was criminalized. And what Marx ends up saying there, because he still believes in this idea of rational law, which he uses as a benchmark for saying that some laws are just, others aren't just, is that as soon as the state in this kind of, you know, liberal, uh, rational state stoops so low as to reduce all of its policies, if you will, or most of its policies to the whims and the interests of private property, that's when it fails as a state and shows that law is actually mortal and, can, and, and, and is quite destructive. And he cites, as many of you who've uh, seen the, uh, the film uh, uh, directed by Raoul Peck, The Young Marx, right? It actually starts oh, with that. It starts with that. It starts with that scene, and Marx actually, in the footnote, cites Montesquieu, talking about how bad laws corrupt people. Mm. Right. So I started there, and I began to see that Marx did, in fact, take rights seriously, some rights anyway, and that that was, you know, significant for his understanding of freedom and how it develops or how it is constrained. But then the next challenge, of course, was, oh, well, okay, so that's the really young Marx. Then you have the problem which was popularized by Louis Althusser, namely the epistemological break, which usually is traced to 1845 or so when uh, Engels and Marx uh, wrote the German ideology. One quick note is that we typically treat the German ideology as a canonical text. It's anything but that. Mm -hmm. And this is something that was recognized by Marx and Engels. It was an incomplete text. And when they reflect on it, Engels in particular, they, re they are remind themselves of how zealous and polemical they are. And in, some, in one letter, in one letter which I don't cite in my book, brought to my attention by Dan Goldstick, um, uh, Engels basically says we would put Heine to shame, uh, you know, with his poetry, given our polemical style. So it's important to understand the context, right? We have a tendency, especially those, you know, in political theory, to read Marx and his works, most of which were not published, as if they're ready-made and complete works, and they're not. There's a whole history of Marxian reception, and that has colored our interpretation of Marx. So the next step was to show actually that there is an important continuity, notwithstanding you know, the development of Marxist thought, him becoming a materialist, quote unquote. We'll see that that's very different from you know, uh, Habesian materialism, for example, Hobbes' materialism, and the French materialist. Marx, because of the influence of uh, idealism, uh, Hegel's in particular, really emphasized the active, sensuous uh, you know, aspects of human life which distinguishes him from other materialists in important ways. But basically, what I wanted to do is to show actually, notwithstanding you know, his uh, conversion to materialism, he nonetheless leaves an important functional and normative role for Recht. And, and Recht is very complicated in German. As you may know, it can include both law uh, and right as a kind of normative standard. Uh, and so Marx uses it in both senses, except when he refers to gazettes, which is positive law or state-made law. So I was able to show that in the works we take for granted as, as, as demonstrating Marx's uh, uh, opposition to rights, German ideology, capital, the mm. Grundrisse, and elsewhere, actually there's more than enough evidence that points to the contrary. And I wanted to bring this evidence to the fore so that readers can judge for themselves whether they can maintain this uh, interpretation in the end, right? A lot of my critics, well, they're mostly sympathetic critics, <clears throat> either on the liberal side and or the Marxist side, some of them, you know, think of themselves as liberal Marxists, <laughs> if you could put that together, is they say that you've gone too far in trying to show that Marx was, you know, uh, so in favor of rights, so in favor of law, that you, that comes at the expense of his critique of, of, um, of, uh, of rights and of uh, liberal or bourgeois law. You know, and in some sense, that's a valid criticism, I would argue. But my response has always been, since my doctoral thesis defense, to Professor Carol Gould, for whom I have a lot of respect, um, that the stick, right, has been pushed so far 
in one direction, namely that Marx is hostile to rights, to law, and to justice, then I try to, you know, uh, change the course of events so that at least, you know, people think twice about uh, jumping to the conclusion. And that's, you know, readers of, in the history of political thought, students, but ordinary people as well, and activists, uh, to think twice before jumping to the conclusion that there's no place for these things in Marx's social political thought. Nice. So I think I think I'll I'll leave it at that so that we can have a conversation. Yeah, yeah. Matt. No, well, I want to say first off that I thought your book was excellent, uh, and as you pointed out, uh, a very well needed uh, corrective uh, to this kind of emphasis um, that a lot of people put on Marx is hostility towards the state and the hostility towards rights. The two problems that I had with Marx's approach to rights uh, prior to reading your book uh, were as follows, right? Uh, the first one was, again, uh, its commitment to the philosophy of history um, in lieu of normative argument. Um, and this argument that there was be a teleological orientation towards history, that eventually things are going to wither away, uh, and this is uh, and the communist state's going to emerge whether you want it or not, right? Um, and I've always been a little bit reticent of that. Uh, and as I pointed out in my review, uh, I think this is the one thing where maybe your book could have um, spent a little bit more time addressing these anxieties, right? Uh, but when it comes to my second anxiety, which was, well, what happens in a communist state or in a Marxist state um, when things went their way and there's no protection for individual rights, you do a fantastic job of explaining why that wouldn't necessarily be the case um, in a Marxist framework, uh, that actually there would be some protections for individual rights, um, but they'd be reframed uh, in this more democratic uh, and more egalitarian fashion. Uh, and Candidly, um, I wouldn't have thought that that would have been possible, uh, that somebody could change my mind on these points, but you made a very compelling case. So that's why I enjoyed the text so much. And actually, could, we, could you maybe explain that, that line of argument to, like, like describe what Matt just called the like egalitarian or democratic way in which individual rights would be ensured in, like, I guess, the communist, uh, I don't know if it's at the point of communism or at the point of socialism, I'm not, but... I'll try to do that and also by returning to your question and the issue about the withering way of the state uh, as I try to answer this question. Well, the first thing to note is that there were two uh, kind of argumentative devices used to make the argument uh, or, you know, for the conclusion that not only will there be a place for law, justice, and rights in this post-capitalist society, but there, there's a functional reason for that, why that would be important. And then there's a normative reason why that would be good, right? Mm -hmm. And not simply, uh, you know, play a functional role. So the functional, uh, the functional argument uh, uh, is, is that for Marx, if we turn to capital and the Grundrisse, he subscribes to the view that every form of production has to have its own legal relations, right? So this could be a purely, if you want, an orthodox view, right? That you can't have... Um, you can't have a base without a superstructure. I'm, I'm being very vulgar and cruel, crude here to use familiar you know, terminology. Mm -hmm. But if let's think that through for just a moment. What he's trying to say is that in order for us to have a mode of production, which for him is expansive, it captures the way that we produce as human beings, how we communicate with each other, right? And that for him says a whole lot about the society in which we are living or the you know, social arrangements under which we produce, including the standard of justice that will prevail, right, that will inform our uh, actions. You see, so the functional argument is that law or a system of right uh, has a stabilizing function. It ensures that the mode of production can sustain itself. Now, that has happened, you know, in, even in pre-state societies to some extent. And sometimes this is inconsistent, but in Engels, he even <coughs> talks about, you know, so-called... Uh, primitive communism or, you know, tribal societies, they do have, you know, a system of rules. And now, mm. you know, living in the colonial, settler colonial context, if we can put it in those terms, legal scholars have come to grips with the fact that there were such things as indigenous legal orders, right? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, functionally, it's important to have a system of rules in order to ensure that people can go about their business, regardless of which society, they, the business may, may be different, but people need to go about their business. So the functional argument, and, and I try to find evidence for that in, in capital, is that law uh, it, it, for Marx is indispensable for functional purposes in order for a mode of production uh, to sustain itself, to consolidate itself, 
and to be distinguished from mere chance and arbitrariness, as he puts it in capital. And he says that this is indispensable in all modes of production. So what follows? What follows is if Marx is to be consistent, that means that to the extent that communism, or there will be such a thing as a communist mode of production, it will also have to have a system of justice that will co help coordinate affairs between individuals. <clears throat> the content of that system will obviously reflect the changed needs of individuals, how they produce and reproduce the materiality, but it cannot, uh, at least uh, for the argument's coherence, it cannot either wither away or disappear. And if it does, then something else has to take its place that will simulate the same uh, functional role, you see? Mm -hmm. So that's a purely functional argument that isn't particularly interesting, but that's framed, you know, strictly speaking, uh, from uh, nature of Marx's arguments, where he says that every form of... Uh, production has to create its own legal relations. So I say, what does that mean for a post-capitalist mode of production? Um, secondly, the normative dimension, right? And for the normative dimension, I had to be a bit more creative, obviously. I can't simply, you know, emphasize uh, this or that passage. And the argument there is that the, there is a reason why there needs to be a system of right in this uh, post-capitalist society. And that reason has to do with Marx's commitment to the free development of individuals and how we are able to reconcile the free development of each with the free development of all. And this has, to some extent, I've been told, you know, parallels with Kant's legal theory. But there is one important difference, which is going to bring me to the question of the state, okay? Uh, in, Kant's, uh, in Kant's doctrine of right, which is now receiving more and more attention because mm -hmm. of uh, the new Kantian hegemony, as some, as some put it in political uh, theory, political philosophy, the only way that we can mediate between the, the freedom of each and the freedom of all, as Kant makes clear, is through coercive law, right? And that law has to be objective. It's not the moral law. It's sort of, this is Kant's legal and political theory, which emphasizes coercion and enforcement, you see? So then the natural question would be, well, what ways is, is uh, uh, Marx different from Kant? Well, this is where the question of the state emerges. What I do in the book, and I think this is really important, I distinguish between state and law, right? Which is not the case in mo for most thinkers in the history of political thought. And this is one area of disagreement I have with another uh, uh, interpreter, commentator, great scholar for whom I have a lot of respect and have uh, talked about these things with him, Alan Wood. Right, uh, who, uh, who's written on all you know the important uh, Jew, classical German idealists, right, uh, from Kant to uh, Fichte and ultimately Marx, <laughs> though he wasn't an idealist, arguably. And uh, what he says in his uh, famous uh, article about Marx and justice is that he grants the possibility <laughs> would that there will be post-capitalist standards of right, and that is hard to deny when we read the critique of the Gotha program but ultimately that there will be no such standards or such standards won't be referenced because the only reason why such standards would, would uh, be referenced is because there would have to be a state that would enforce the right, you see? So as, as far as Kant is concerned, we know that there will be such a state. Now, what happens in the Marxian framework? So what I did is I, I tried to disentangle state and law. Just like I mentioned earlier, that there are such things as indigenous legal orders. Mm -hmm. There weren't states as such. There were collective organization, uh, forms of organization that enabled people to go about their daily lives subject to a common set of rules. In Karl Polanyi's uh, Great Transformation and other works, he refers to you know, economic transactions, if you will, as being embedded in certain normative obligations and, and understandings that people have toward one another in a given society. Right Now, what I try to do is to show from Marx's really early work, I would say the uh, critique of Hegel's doctrine of the state, his notes on the philosophy of right, right? There is this view that the state, what Hegel calls the state, is superimposed upon individuals and societies. Another version of that argument occurs in the, on the Jewish question. And most people miss out the fact that Marx actually cites Rousseau in On the Jewish Question. He cites Rousseau's uh, legislator or lawgiver, right, mm -hmm. as exemplifying uh, the prototypical, if you were, the quintessential form of alienation. Uh, because, as Rousseau puts it in the social contract, we have to figure out a way, right, that we would give uh, people alien powers, powers that they wouldn't otherwise have. Now, Marx, uh, you know, cites Rousseau to show that what Rousseau was really getting at, you know, with Marx's strategic purpose in mind. Is he's, he's basically discussing 
uh, the modern form of alienation were by human beings. And remember, he was influenced, Marx was influenced by Feuerbach here, project their powers, their social powers onto an alien entity that then dominates them. That alien entity initially is, of course, God in, in the Feuerbachian sense. But then for Marx, because he wants to move beyond Feuerbach in his critique, it becomes the liberal state itself or the modern state itself that claims that citizens are free and equal. Whereas in the sphere of civil society, and he, he actually cites, you know, the Habesian uh, teaching, the war of all against all. So we are divided selves in on the Jewish question. And what I realized is that when you read his uh, notes on Hegel's uh, uh, doctrine of the state, the philosophy of right, you read on the Jewish question, those early writings, you read on the Holy Family, uh, collaborative work with Engels, you begin to see that he has a specific uh, point in mind with respect to the state and which aspect of which specific aspect of the state will have to wither away. Although he doesn't use that language, by the way, so I'll get into that shortly. <clears throat> and that has to do with this external alienating dimension of the state that is superimposed upon individuals. And my argument in the book is that this view continues up until, at the very least, not only his discussion with Bakunin, right, the critical exchange with Bakunin, the anarchist, but also the critique of the Gotha program, where he says that the real function isn't to call it a liberal state or a free state. He makes fun of that. What is a free state, he says? The chief goal should be to um, uh, uh, see to it that the state, instead of being something that's superimposed upon society, is entirely subordinate to it. In other words, it's similar to what he says in the Jew Jewish question, that instead of projecting our social powers onto this alien entity, we have to take those powers back, right? So that the state doesn't stand in opposition to us as individuals and as members of society, but that we are in charge of the state rather than the state being in charge of us. And that goes to what he says in, in the, um, in the uh, uh, notes on Hegel's philosophy of right, you know, when he says that democracy uh, is the solved riddle of all constitutions, why? Because the people, you know, the demos is supposed to constitute it's law or it's laws, you see? Whereas he takes issue with Hegel that ultimately no constitutional monarchy it can somehow represent the will, the interests of the people. So that in the democracy, he says in that early work, form and content are not at loggerheads. You know, they're actually reconciled. So what I want to do is basically say that in the critique of the Gotha program uh, and in his exchange with Bakunin, the critical exchange with Bakunin, that's what will wither away, quote unquote, the reason why I say quote unquote is because Engels was the one who makes reference to the withering away of the state. And even he qualifies it by saying it's not so much a withering away, it's more like it dies out and becomes superfluous, which is an important distinction. And obviously Engels didn't think that, you know, what we would today call the state's administrative functions, including, you know, uh, uh, the things that you were mentioning, uh, uh, Victor, about the, the various complexities in a modern society that necessitate uh, you know, uh, an administrative apparatus of some kind to help coordinate the affairs of individuals, service provision and so on and so forth. So I don't think that either Engels or Marx, judging by what I've read anyway, thought that that would wither away. What they did, didn't like uh, is this repressive organ that superimposed upon society that comes to dominate individuals instead of being a vehicle, as it should be in Kant's thought, mm. for example for their emancipation. Uh, and we get more evidence for that in, the, uh, in his reflections on the uh, Paris Commune, where he talks about you know, the commune's uh, legit, the legitimate functions of courts, for example, or if not courts, then uh, the civil servants. So I think, I think what happened you know, uh, is people read these things, right? And sort of ran with it, assuming that you know, there will be no room for a collective administrative organ that will, you know, uh, uh, help people go about their business. And that law is intricately bound up with such a repressive state. And of course, if we read Kant, then that's exactly the view that we will, uh, we will get. And that's what happens with, I think, Alan Wood's interpretation is the reason why they can't be a post-capitalist, let's call it a communist conception of right, is because there would have to be a state. Now they can't be a state. So a communist state would be a contradiction in terms in that sense, right? Mm. And so, of course, when you start with a set of assumptions, which, which reads Marx, right, from the beginning of his, you know, of his intellectual career to the bitter end as being hostile to the idea of the state 
in every sense of the word, then you're going to arrive at that conclusion. And I think that's what happened in most interpretations. But we also have to account for what I've just raised, you know, his exchange with Bakunin, his -hmm. reflections on the Paris Commune, the idea that the state's legitimate functions would be restored to the responsible agents of society, that its illegitimate uh, functions would be, um, you know, I forget the exact word that he uses, amputated, is what he says. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, what that tells us is even there, a short-lived you know, uh, re- revolt, if you will, citizens of Paris and so on. It's radical. And it, they weren't, most of them weren't you know, Marxists, right? <laughs> That's also important to understand. Uh, for Marx, you know, he was constantly asked, well, give us, give us a picture of what the dictatorship of the proletariat looks like. Engels, for his part, says, look to the Paris Commune. That's the dictatorship of the poor dead. So for those of us who are worried about, you know, the specter of totalitarianism, we have to look at what the Paris Commune was all about. It was really decentralized, for example, um, and it didn't seek to destroy the state as such, smash the state as such. It wanted to smash, according to Marx's interpretation, at least a charitable interpretation, um, its illegitimate function. Those would have to be amputated. Whereas its legitimate functions, right, would have to be restored, and we, we, we you know, we refer to legitimate, right, uh, in the sense that this is something that the citizens would actually want to preserve, right, would stand by, would support. So I think we have to pay attention to these things and, and to go against the grain of an interpretation that has been so, you know, sort of etched in our in our brains and our minds as students of political thought. So I was especially grateful to Matt that he opens his review by uh, my book, by, you know, recounting his own experience as a student, uh-huh. right? Because as, edu- as educators, I think we have a duty to give the best possible case for any given thinker that we're teaching. We can't start with our, you know, prejudiced assumptions about Plato, Aristotle, Marx, even Heidegger, let's say, right? Or, or Schmidt, for example, right? We have to try and present the, the, the thinker as they understood themselves, or at least show all the complexities. And let's let the students right, and the readers decide for themselves which interpretation they find most plausible and convincing. And I think, you know, if I accomplish anything in this book is to at least get us to think twice, you know, about preaching uh, the interpretation of Marx as, uh, as having only contempt for rights, as has been done, you know, historically. And if there is any accomplishment, I would want it to be that accomplishment. And then this would be followed up with the various political implications that it may or may not have for those who identify as being on the left and on the radical left in, in particular. I, I have two follow-up questions. Uh, one is, is there really, um, what is a more theoretical question I should say, and then one gets more to the heart uh, of the controversy around your book. Uh, so the more theoretical question is, uh, would you actually characterize the, let's call it, materialist conception of right uh, that you developed in your book as being sharply demarcated from a Kantian conception of right? Uh, and the reason that I make this argument is if you take something like Arthur Ripstein's interpretation of Kant, it doesn't seem all that different uh, from what you're talking about, because Ripstein's argument, of course, is that while, yes, there will be a coercive state uh, on a Kantian conception of how liberalism should operate, uh, the reason this coercion of just is justified is, of course, because on the Kantian conception, any law that's imposed upon us is a law that we give to ourselves uh, in this kind of Republican framework. Um, you know, we deliberate, we pass laws, and, and of course, you know, Gripstein points out that this is very much uh, in keeping with Rousseau's influence on Kant, uh, very similar to the influence Rousseau had on Marx, right? Uh, and the second uh, question I had for you that is, again, more to the heart of the issue is, uh, in your book, you talk about how uh, a communist state would be, as you put it, uh, stamped uh, with the influence uh, of what came before. And I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on what you mean by uh, the influence of what came before uh, in a potential communist future. Well, the first thing to, to note is I'll start with your uh, uh, um, comment about Arthur Ripstein. Mm-hmm. It just so happens that I wrote an article in the Canadian uh, Journal of Law and Jurisprudence, mm-hmm. which uh, draws upon the legal theory of Evgeny Pashakarnas who is sort of my antagonist in the book because I have to respond to him. Again, I have a lot of respect for Pashakanis, but I think he made a tragic error, theoretical and ultimately political, which cost him his life. I'm not making a causal claim here because you know, I don't want to exaggerate the, the power of legal and political theory. But the reason why it matters in this context, the reason why it matters in this context is because the question of legal theory, legal philosophy, uh, at, in the Soviet Union during that time was a question of life and death. And that's actually how I conclude 
uh, yeah. that article. The article is called uh, Estranged Bedfellows, Why uh, Contemporary Formalists, Legal Formalists, Should Be Worried About Pashukanis. And I show a strange convergence between uh, Pashukanis on the one hand and contemporary uh, neo-Kantian, perhaps it's fair to call them Kantian formalists because there's no neo as far as I'm concerned. They think that Kant has all the resources necessary for a full-blown legal theory. And they may be right about that, but that doesn't mean that that's particularly appealing uh, or successful legal theory. Um, so what I do is I begin by uh, showing what the legal uh, formalists have in common with Pashukanis. And it turns out uh, that both of them place an inordinate em emphasis on private law and commodity exchange. And they want that to be separate from, conceptually separate from, autonomous from, and distinct from public law. And Ripstein uh, does a, an excellent job, in my view, in his book, uh, Private Wrongs, uh, showing why that's really important. He does it really clearly. But I take issue with his interpretation and show that politically, in any case, if you're committed to distributive justice, as Rawlsians uh, are, uh, the, the view that the, Kant, you know, the, the Kantian formals put forward, like Ripstein, is actually um, uh, riddled with uh, all these contradictions and tensions between a private right and public right, public law and pri uh, private law. So Pashukhanis, for his part, sees the distinguishing feature of law as not regulatory, right? Law, law you know, if we were to define law, Typically, you know, if you turn to a legal theorist, they'll say it has something to do with this comprehensive set of authoritative rules, right, that help coordinate society. Well, for Pashukhanis, and that's his brilliance, too, that he was able to pinpoint it. He said, well, that doesn't explain how law is different from the army, for example, right? <laughs> there are also authoritative rules, in fact, all the more repressive, or the church, right, where there's hierarchy and there are rules as well. And so what ends up happening is legal theorists who subscribe to this view actually miss out on what makes law distinctive. And for, for Pashukhanis, he follows Gumpelwitz in his book, The General Theory of Law of Marxism, as saying that conflict is the starting point of law, mm. an opposition of interest, but not of any interest, right? Because we could say there could be an opposition of interest between citizens. No, that's not what Pashukhanis has in mind. It's the opposition of private interests between bearers of rights and commodity owners in particular, in other words, owners of private property. And this, this line in Pashukhanis is, is very close, has close affinity with the formalists. For them, private right, private law, law of torts, property, and so on, I would even say contract, if we are to be consistent, is the, is the real distinguishing feature of law. It's the real law. And everything else follows from that, because it, it, it rests on the idea of the legal or juridical person. But the reason why I end up criticizing Arthur Ripstein's private wrongs in the end is by saying that by absolutizing private right, the idea, you know, that freedom and all other forms of law is to be sought in this idea of being an owner of private property, engaging in commodity exchange, actually prevents, right, the, the, on the best interpretation, the Rawlsian ideal of distributive justice that Ripstein and others like him assign to public law and to public right. In other words, you can't do anything about um, a private right. You can't change it. But in public law, it's all about redistribution. It's all about distributive justice. However, private law, private right is all about corrective justice. So what I end up showing, actually citing Marx's Grundrisse, Marx has a very witty passage in the Grundrisse where he says, look, let's take one of the most progressive economists of the time. And that was John Stuart Mill, a classical liberal who became something of a socialist or more inclined, you know, to um, profit sharing and cooperatives closer to the end of his life. Mill says that we can't do anything about production. It's like a law of nature, the way the production is organized. But in, in distribution, right, we have zero, you know, we have 100, uh, let's say 360 degrees of, uh, of arbitrariness. We can do what we want. So I assign the same view to Arthur Ripstein. Uh, in the sense of, uh, as far as private rights is concerned, we can't change the structure of property relations. Those have to be fixed because otherwise we would undermine what private rights stands for. The, you know, the autonomy of entering into contracts as people wish, except that certain parties within private right end up dominating others who don't own a private property of a certain kind. But then as soon as we get to public right, to public law, you know, we arrive at the Rawlsian state. I don't find that convincing in the least, frankly. 
And I think it, it actually leads to a conflict between the, the two goals. On the one hand, in private rights, the goal is to allow for, you know, uh, unlimited, unfettered commodity exchange. Mm -hmm. And then in public, right, the state, right, is it's tasked with this role of making everyone a full citizen. Right? How to reconcile that, it's not made clear in, in Ripstein's private wrongs. And it, it, and it tends to emphasize, in my view, the worst features of both spheres of right. In private right, what's emphasized is the libertarian uh, extreme. You know, you can't intervene in private right, otherwise you dissolve private right into public right. In the public right, on the contrary, what you do is you absolutize the role of the state. In other words, the state can do as it pleases if it wishes to realize distributive justice. That too is a problem if you're a libertarian, for example, uh, or if you're worried that private right would be dissolved. So conceptually, you can have these rigid distinctions, but in practice, we know, you know, there's a revolving door between the two spheres of right, I would argue. And for this reason, I think that if we're really interested about reconciling and maintaining, you know, uh, a difference between private right and public right, we actually have to talk about the structure of property relations. We can't say, as Ripstein and others do, uh, Ripstein is influenced, by the way, uh, by another very important legal theorist, namely uh, Ernst, uh, uh, Ernst uh, Weinrib, um, uh, who uh, you know, is famous for putting forward this view of corrective justice. So in order for us to really reconcile public and private right, what we have to do is to pay attention to the structure of property relations and how they either undermine or support both private right and public right. So if it turns out, right, that, and this is actually a, an insight I got from Alan Wood, I shared my article with Alan Wood in advance, and he says, well, wait a second, you could, you could be a Kantian, pardon me, and support, you know, uh, a vision that is hostile and opposed to exploitation, right? Because what ends up happening in a capitalist society is that uh, the rights of workers, they're, they're as sui juris, as being their own masters, right? As being their own legislators is undermined because they're subject not only to the will of another individual, the capitalist, right? For whom they work, but also of an impersonal system that instead of being a vehicle for their freedom actually enslaves them as wage slaves, right? So, so what is, to, to bring it back to your question, right? So what is, in what ways is my view different from the Kantian view? One, is that, is that, a, is that a fair way of... Uh, yeah, the way I want to frame it is this. Like, granted, I absolutely agree that Marx would be far more critical of private property uh, and property relations than Kant would be. Uh, I don't think there's any dispute about that. Um, but I think that Ripstein's point in Force and Freedom is that Ultimately, Kant is committed to a conception uh, of social freedom because he says that any kind of law that is imposed from above needs to emerge from the bottom up, right? It needs to be a law that we give to ourselves. Uh, and I'm close what I'm saying, you know, really down to earth is how would democratic procedures be different on a market conception uh, than on this Kantian conception? Right? Can I can uh, I just add to that? Too? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, like I guess another way, like I, I maybe had a similar question too, which because you were talking about like the problem with the state is that you're letting the state regulate the public, like all the public, right? Like, and you see that as a problem. And I guess like I initially thought, and maybe it's related to what Matt said is like, but if the state is legitimate in the sense that, that like the laws come from below that are, that are regulating the public, right? Then why would that be necessarily like, you know, prima facie bad? Okay. So in principle, maybe, you know, on a charitable interpretation, it's bottom up, but it's at least as far, and I'm, I'm teaching <laughs> Kant's doctrine of right in my modern political theory course, because I think it's very important. In practice, or at least, you know, it's practical implications is we have to understand that Kant um, does have a fairly generous, uh, uh, you know, you could say uh, provisions for welfare of the poor, but let's not forget, and uh, I could be wrong, maybe Jacob Weiner or Ernie Weiner will correct me after this podcast if, if they tune into it, that notwithstanding these generous provisions, of, because he realizes that the vast majority of individuals are actually heteronomous, they're dependent upon others. But notice he then uses that as an argument for excluding the vast majority of individuals from political participation. And that's something that, of course, uh, you know, thinkers, Kantians like Ripstein and, uh, and Weiner wouldn't want to emphasize, but that's a fact. If we, if we take him seriously, he basically says it's because they're heteronomous. It's because, you know, the working poor and uh, wage laborers or day laborers 
uh, are poor, that they are dependent. And in other words, they could be manipulated, their will may be manipulated, uh, including by the wealthy, which is why we should exclude them from this process. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't, you know, uh, help them as far as social welfare is concerned to be full citizens. But you can't be, with all due respect, you can't be a full citizen if you're excluded from the process of participating in making your own laws. So that speaks to an inconsistency in Kant's uh, legal and political authority, uh, uh, thought, granted. Uh, so one important difference is, um, this is why, you know, I think private property is important. It's not, so in Marx, it's not a basis for political participation uh, and representation, right? For Marx, what ends up happening is it's, it's an important fetter to political uh, participation, full citizenship, although ultimately Marx isn't, you know, bound up with citizenship because citizenship is bound up, strictly speaking, with the territorial uh, boundaries of the, of the nation state. And he was looking forward to internationalism, right? There will still be nations, but the relationship between nations will be very different. And that's also not a world state or a federation of, of states in this Kantian framework, the latter being a federation of uh, republics. So uh, one thing to note is that Kant is not entirely clear of including everyone in the process of making their own laws to which they are subject. In principle, as Alan Wood said correctly to me, he is committed to the first kind of innate right mm -hmm. of being your own, um, you know, being your own master. And I think that's something that's really important. And in some sense, yes, there is an important convergence between Marx and Kant here. Mm -hmm. Except Marx, I would argue, is more consistent with that than is Kant in his, uh, in his social and political thought. And this has also given rise, I think, to another dimension in Marxian scholarship with the work of uh, William Clare Roberts, with uh, uh, Bruno Leopold, uh, with uh, Camilla uh, Vergara, right? This kind of an attempt to republicanize <laughs> Marx. And I think in some sense it's good, but in some sense it has its limitations. And for me, the biggest limitation is that in the Republican tradition, and in Kant, I include Kant in this uh, tradition and Rousseau, in order for us to talk about domination, right? And think about the new Republican tradition in particular. Domination has to be bound up with a particular empirical person who exercises the arbitrary will over other individuals. Right. Now, Marx... Right? I think I give credit to William Clay Roberts for at least being attuned to this point. He still wants to situate Marx along with Gurevich in the you know, radical Republican tradition. I say to a point that works. But then there's the impersonal system, the capitalist market system that is not personal, that you can't be, you know, you can't point your finger and hold a particular individual to account. That also makes Marxian social and political thought distinctive. You'll remember. I know you've written a lot about, uh, you know, the work of Jordan Peterson <laughs> from a, from a you know, left, left wing critical perspective. The so dad, the dad of our podcast. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so let me just bring up the only thing that I found relatively intellectually stimulating with his debate, in his debate with Slavoj Žižek. Uh, it wasn't the point that he hadn't read the Communist Manifesto for 30 years. I mean, you can't blame people for not reading. First of all, the Communist Manifesto, for the record, was a political pamphlet. It's not a, yeah. you know, the a classic work of art. I mean, you say you can't blame him. I would. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, I, if you're going to sit there and hate pot shots at a whole intellectual tradition, then you should be pretty knowledgeable of that tradition, right? I think as an academic, that's a fairly minimal expectation. Huh? Yeah, it's like... Fair enough. You're the authority on this stuff. Not <laughs> but I would, it, does bring me, it does bring me to my, my critical point. There was a point in which uh, Peterson, during this debate, was referring to Marx's alleged view that capitalists are evil. Notice this moralizing view, which Marx actually never entertained. He did talk about capitalism, the system itself, as being defined by you know blood dripping, vampire sucking, and so on, all the rest of it. But notice these are all impersonal, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, kind of characterizations, and that's important because for Marx, you know, as I tell my my students using various, you know, outdated pop cultural and problematic references, it's the game and not the player. <laughs> right. And so right. there's a reason for that because, and this is why it's important to distinguish him from the Republican, neo-Republican tradition is you can't blame a specific emp empirical individual and say that the domination, right, stems from that because the domination is also by a class, right, that owns the means of production and uses that politically to their advantage indirectly. Rawls recognized that as a problem in justice is fairness restatement, which is why in my book, I try to show that as far as the liberal tradition is concerned in the, in the 20th century, Rawls stands as one of the 
only thinkers to have really taken Marxist critique seriously and tried to respond to it. Yeah, I agree. Mm-hmm. Right? So Rawls recognizes that. And then, you know, the only, in my view, liberal political theorists that really have made an effort to deal with this problem are those like, you know, Iris, Mary, and Young, talk, talking about structural forms of oppression and injustice. But the problem is they are not as attuned as Marx was to the extent to which capitalism as a system, rather than simply, you know, an association of individuals, uh, generates those, not only inequalities, but forms of domination. So I guess one important difference would be that, that the Republican tradition in its contemporary forms, has to track, and this comes from Roman law, right? Mm-hmm. It comes from that tradition, has to track it back to a specific empirical person. And in fact, in my article in the Canadian Journal of Law and Jurisprudence, where I take issue with Ripstein, I argue that he's great at showing how domin- you know, personal domination or direct domination, Ripstein is great, and the Republican tradition does an excellent job. But what happens when the nature of the domination is Impersonal. Well, then, according to the formalists, the Kantian formalists, no private wrong exists, except we know, for those of us anyway, who think that workers are exploited and taken advantage of. And this, does, by the way, doesn't have to rest on a labor theory of value. People just say, ah, oh, you subscribe to labor theory of value. That's, that's why we don't have to take your critique seriously. It's not so simple, right? It's that you end up entering into a contract where everyone is free and equal, and somehow one party to that contract ends up enriching itself and the other either finds itself poorer, right, or subject to greater heteronomy. And it's up to the contents to explain why that is, whereby a contract that begins among equals ends with unequals, right? Uh, so I think, I think this, the issue is figuring out if you're a Republican, right, in this either Skinnerian or Petitian, p- Petitian uh, <laughs> variant, or I would say, you know, my, my colleagues, uh, uh, Bruno Leopold and uh, uh, Will Clim- uh, Chambers uh, is, uh, uh, oh, sorry, William Clare Roberts, is, is that uh, the challenge is to figure out how we can hold people accountable, and if not people, a system accountable uh, to generating various forms of domination within the confines of a Republican uh, thought that is still tethered to Roman law, you know, parameters, right? Um, so that would be my challenge. In terms of uh, the second point, if I may, about uh, how uh, a communist society would nonetheless inherit, right, the developments unleashed by a capitalist society, that comes directly from the critique of the GOAT program, mm-hmm. except, of course, Marx is talking about the so-called first stage of communism. He says very clearly what we have to deal with is communist society, not as, his, as it has developed on its own foundation, but just as it emerges, right? from the womb of the capitalist society. And in that sense, is morally, intellectually, technologically, if you will, economically, right? Um, uh, colored, if you will, with uh, the, um, the norms and the practices that it inherits from such a society. So in other words, what I wanted to do is to show the dialectical nature of Marx's argument, right? For the generation of a kind of a communist conception of right, first the first stage he even refers to as uh, as really making good on bourgeois right, because no one you know so you have people being remunerated according to their labor power right, and that leads to a whole host of inequalities. And so he says we still we still have it's, it's a it's an advance this first stage, because now we don't have people being exploited, and people get the workers if you will. Uh, get remunerated based on the work that they produce, right, or that they do. Uh, but that will lead to various inequalities. And right, instead of being equal as a standard, would have to be unequal. Because human beings, he says, are unequal and, and different. By the way, this may, this may be a, a provocation, Matt, but uh, Marx was not an egalitarian in the strict sense of the word. What do I mean by that? We, we can understand egalitarianism in many different respects. We could understand the idea of a moral equality, right? That's the idea that human beings are essentially born free and equal in that sense. Then there's political equality, that as far as political participation goes, there should be no differences or constraints. Unlike, let's say, in John Stuart Mill, who thought that some people should be given more votes than others because mm-hmm. of that, yeah. right? I'm just, just, just as an example, I'm not trying yeah. to criticize him here. Uh, there are other way, reasons to criticize him, perhaps. Sure. Um, uh, and then there is another another variant with, with which we were most familiar, the distributive dimension, the economic egalitarian. He was not an economic egalitarian. Uh, 
And which is why I always, you know, when I teach Marx, particularly the, particularly the Gotha program, I ask my students two questions. One, can we equalize people's needs? And the second question, can we equalize their abilities? Theoretically, maybe, but not in practice. And that stems from Marx's, you know, complex view of the individual, right? That human beings, that there's something concrete about human beings that can never be subject to one homogenous egalitarian standard. Mm -hmm. Because if we would do that, we would end up treating individuals arbitrarily. So he does, he, he, granted, and this is where Jerry Cohen comes in, he does say that in the first stage, right, the fact that some workers are going to be more productive, obviously, and they're going to get more, uh, you know, uh, rewards as a consequence of their productivity, th there's a problem there because we treat genetic endowments, Rawls, Rawls obviously also grants that, as if they're natural privileges. But what Marx is getting at isn't like egalitarianism, in my view. It's that, you know, as he says, the needs of the stomach, right? Uh, and one's productive output should not be, you know, fused because we all have the needs of the stomach, right? Obviously, mm -hmm. some more than others. And the same thing goes <laughs> with healthcare, right? But he doesn't want, you know, one's productivity and endowments to be a basis for, you know, preventing others from realizing their capacities, right? So he wants to sort of separate those two. But he realizes, you know, I think as a pragmatist, uh, someone who's pragmatic, I should say, that uh, within the first stage, right, of, of communism, we're still very much, you know, living with the legacy of the past. And we still believe in the idea that we should be paid according to our labor, except in this stage, we would actually follow through with that, with that uh, principle. We won't have one class exploiting another because there will be only one class, right? In this case, it's the, the class of uh, how everyone becomes a worker. But that he too finds that defective because everything else about the individual worker is ignored. The concrete is ignored. And we're, we're putting everyone under the same standard, but the application of the same standard for different individuals will result in inequalities, in, in quite detrimental inequalities. And so that's why he hopes that with the development of the productive forces, right, there will be something like relative abundance with respect to food, shelter, and clothing, so that we won't you know, be so fixated on who gets what, how much, Right. Instead, we'll figure out a way in which people will be able to contribute according to their abilities and consume according to, the, to their needs. And as Alan Wood says correctly, that is not an egalitarian principle in the sense of economic egalitarian oh. principle, because we can't equalize people's needs or their ability. And if we do that, we would actually do an injustice to them uh, as far as right. Marx is concerned, I'd argue. That's interesting. I completely agree with you that I don't think Marx is an economic egalitarian in the strict sense of the word. Uh, but I think he's an egalitarian in the more fundamental sense, and he shares this with the liberal tradition uh, in the sense that he believes in the moral equality uh, of all individuals, right? Which is something that's very distinct from what I'd rather call the reactionary tradition, uh, you know, embodied in somebody like Nietzsche, who says that you know, some people are worth more than others, fundamentally, right? right? Uh, you can also right. like situate uh, Aristotle and a few others in that kind of situation. Yeah, okay. okay. Um, can I just like push on one thing? Yeah. Right on? So I just want. So I'm wondering. Earlier, you said something about like the Marxist conception of law, and you, you know, you you paralleled it with some in, some indigenous concepts of law, right? Where there's like rules that are that are sort of collectively um, collectively determined or collectively reached. And I guess my question about that is. You know, like would that that it sounds to me to imply like positive rights in the sense that it sounds like with that kind of structure, you require people to actually be participating actively in some ways to make those laws like they have to be a participant in the lawmaking. And, they, they, and in other words, they have certain responsibilities, right? Like if you think about I mean, not that I'm an expert on indigenous law by any means, but there's like an expectation that people in those communities will be like active participants in order to maintain the traditions. Right. And I, and I guess that's something that like coming from maybe my own more liberal like perspective, like I really like negative liberties. Like I really like to not be bothered, like leave me alone. I don't want to be forced to, I'm lazy. I don't want to go to like commune meetings and like decide how much we're going to be doing and how we're going to be maintaining like the, the social order. And like, you know, if I don't want to participate in those things, like I'd rather just have some alienated structure, take care of that in the background for me. Right. So, so I'm just wondering you know, from my, my sort of like, like dirty lib provocation. Like, I wonder if you, you had some thoughts about that. Like, you know, cause, cause if that's the conception of law, that's like a Marxist law, like I'm not interested, you know? You know? Right. Just wanted to let the fuck alone. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me, uh, preface that with an anti-communist joke, uh, by telling it to you, to your example, 
that after the revolution you will learn to attend uh, to love attending commune meetings so that won't be a problem yeah. <laughs> but uh, to, end, to be on a serious note uh, well I use that example and actually that quickly that reminds me of that of that old saying you know freedom is an endless meeting right <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, apparently apparently yeah. um, uh, so 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 two things the first is that you know I use the example of indigenous legal orders to show that it would be possible to come up with a conception of law uh, or of right that is, on the one hand, pre-state or not necessarily bound up with the state, that's the first thing, and also that it's not necessarily bound up with private property because we know in most indigenous communities, not all, private property doesn't have the same significance that it has you know, in our society and its frameworks, right? So to be at least open to the possibility that not all forms of law are necessarily bound up with the state and with private property. And I'm actually interested in this on the research kind of level of note as well, uh, to learn from, you know, indigenous legal orders to show the extent to which, you know, there's the tension with the Marxist tradition because Marxism is thoroughly modern, not, you know, and, and that comes with a whole series of implications and consequences. Uh, uh, but also to criticize, you know, the, the Kantian tradition and to Pashikanis, right? Pashikanis, in my view, in the same article in the Canadian Journal of Law and Jurisprudence, cannot make sense of any uh, conception of law that isn't bourgeois. I mean, that's a problem because what it does, it basically says that we're bound up with bourgeois law and it's the end of history. And for a Marxist, that's really bizarre. And then what do you offer to, in its stead? Technical regulation. So we're trying to figure out, you know, when we make up rules, what's the most efficient way of moving from point A to point B without asking about what human costs that may have. We just take it for granted that we'll agree on that. Well, I haven't been persuaded by that. But Mar uh, by the way, Pashukanis is the most systematic legal theorist in the Marxist tradition, right? Which is why we must take him seriously. But let me respond by also kind of really bringing it back to a question about the inheritance of various aspects of capital society that I didn't fully articulate in my previous response. In the Grindrasa, which was one of my four, more favorite works, Marx is really Hegelian there, he talks about this kind of uh, three-stage process without the teleological thing in mind. I think it, there it's sort of conceptual, right? That there's certain features in pre-capitalist societies that distinguish them from capitalist societies, including, uh, he, I think he would agree, uh, indigenous uh, forms of association, right? What ends up happening in the pre-modern world, in Marx's view, is that there isn't a separate sphere carved out for the individual. Right, the private sphere, where they could, as I've said previously, assert themselves as individuals. We know from Constant, right, that the liberty of the ancients prevented that sphere from developing. We know that in Plato's Republic, that's something that we want to banish, right? Hegel reminds us about mm -hmm. that. And that's an injustice. It's in the Is this thing that I'm attached to here, that's the private sphere, you think? <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I think that's a big part of it, right? Which is why I think private property became so important, because it was an attempt to try and prevent the state from swallowing up that sphere and the individual's sphere of, you know, for self-assertion. So mm -hmm. we shouldn't simply, you know, poo-poo on that. And, and, and um, <laughs> Marx doesn't, you know, even in the, you know, Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844, he, he argues that one of the defects of what he calls crude communism, barracks communism, is that it hasn't fully appreciated the contribution of private property to not only the flowering of human needs, but also to the creation of civilization, though it includes alienation. And so what he sees communism as, and that is the, is the retrieval, again, like in the, on the Jewish question, right? Uh, and the reappropriation, right? Of nature and of objects, human desires for the human being. So whatever concept of, well, in my book, I basically say that Marx still has room for a concept of individual property. A personal property, individual eingentum, right? Which is basically uh, goes against the grain of most interpretations because everyone reads in the Communist Manifesto, if communism can be summed up in one line, abolition of private property. But then it follows mm -hmm. with, with, with a very clear designation that individual property would not be abolished, right? No one reads that past that point. You have to understand it's a polemical article. And that's what right. led to the view that they'll simply, there's simply common ownership of the means of production and no individual property at all. So in the Grundrisse, he talks about a pre-modern society, the first stage, where the individual is kind of fully submerged in the community, 
doesn't exist in, as an individual as such. And maybe you could argue that that's the case in indigenous legal orders. But and that's the thing I'm scared of, I guess. Yeah, yeah. But again, first of all, that that is an anthropological question as well. We actually need to know what you know. We can't just assume that that's the case. And I think Marx is assuming in some sense. And he's not simply talking, he's talking about all forms of association where the individual is submerged in the community. And he calls that, as, you know, in, in various places, a system of direct domination, right? right. Um, I'm glad you said that because I was going to bring up that as being also a form of domination potentially. So I'm glad you brought that up. So this is in the Grundus and I actually have a, I don't have my book on hand, but I'll be able to, to find it for you. And then the second stage is a, is a stage where there's a system of formal freedom in place. Right, and what he calls objective dependence. And he's referring to a cap capitalist form of association, where on the one hand, we're formally free, but we also are unfree in the sense that we're dependent on an impersonal system that then comes to dominate us, right? But the virtue of such a system is that it, it really you know, generates our needs. It shows our creative capacities for the first time. It carves out a separate space for the individual, which is a real development, not, not simply a deceptive one. We are indeed alienated, but it's through that alienation that we come to realize that we have capacities as individuals and we're not merely products of the community. And so in the third, the third stage, as he puts it, he's talking about communism. He refers to free individuality, right? And what, what's interesting is he says that the second condition, the second stage creates the conditions for the third, which is why the development of exchange relations is so important, right, for Marx, even though it also produces right, because of the capitalist structure of production, the system of production, also produces alienation, inequalities of various sorts, class inequalities in particular, and forms of domination. But notice he says that the third uh, stage, stage depends upon the development proliferation of the second, so, which leads me back to the point about inheriting the developments of capitalism. Those are not simply technical or technological, they're also ethical if, in, a, in, in a sense. Uh, in capital, to go back to the equality part, he, he criticizes Aristotle, he draws on Aristotle's discussion of use and exchange, but then he says that the reason why Aristotle couldn't make sense of a um, homogenous conception of value, a kind of a, how can we exchange houses and beds, two qualitatively different commodities? Well, the reason why he can't make sense of that, according to Marx, he could be wrong, is because Aristotle lived in a society which was defined and characterized by slavery, including inequalities in the quality of, um, of labor, Right? So labor could not have been the unifying standard of value. And he says the only context in which that is possible is when equality becomes a popular prejudice. So it goes back to the point about entering into contract. Contracts can only be entered into by equals, not between slaves and masters. Slaves cannot enter into contracts, neither can serfs, they, because they're conceived as, as articles of property. And that first stage, that first stage, uh, he ref it's part of this view that the individual is submerged in the community or is simply seen as an article of production or mm. of property that belongs to someone else. So the great uh, legacy, if you will, of capitalism or the strivings towards capitalism is that it develops the concept of the individual as a legal person. And we mm. talked about that showing itself most clearly in Roman law, the idea right. of the you know, juridical persona. But obviously that too was contradicted by the reality of slavery and other forms of inequality, right? Because it wasn't extended. That status was not extended to everyone. And, uh, you know, thinkers like Charles Mills, right, have written a lot about the political economy of personhood and how just being a human being is not a precondition for being a person. Corporations mm -hmm. can be persons, but not all human beings have been recognized as mm -hmm. persons. It's just important to understand. But without that, we can't have a communist conception of the social individual. And so it, I've always found it abs absurd, frankly, that people would say you'd have the withering away of the legal person in a communist society. Well, if that's the case, then we have to revert back to a situation where the individual is entirely submerged in the community. So what Marx, this is why, you know, dialectics is important and Hegel is important here. What he wants to do is he wants to uh, sublate, right, the, the, the contradictions and the tensions, right, in the capitalist society by kind of reconstituting the legal person on a new and higher basis. Because if that's not the case, then you have to, you know, we have to go back in time, you know, and, and I guess we're left with yeah. the individual submerged into the community. And Marx doesn't think that that's emancipation. It's, we haven't even reached political emancipation in that such a context.
It's funny though that some modern leftists seem to seem to want that, hold that view, some uh, a little bit. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I mean. I mean, which is why I think we get the pushback uh, uh, when you try to argue that there's room for a, both a reconstitution of the juridical person of rights and even of a legal system beyond capitalism. You get this criticism that okay, you know, liberalism is the end of history. I, I've never argued that. I don't argue that in the book. Yeah, yeah, um, of course. But it's easy to arrive at such a conclusion because, again, it's it's a very Manichaean view, right? You just see either liberalism or, or no liberalism, and may, maybe you do. I don't know, Victor, but I don't. <laughs> and, yeah, no, no. I mean, you're you're bringing up provoc like uh, convincing, interesting points here, but so that that can be found easily in the Grundrisse. Uh, and remember, in the Critique of the Goethe program, he says right can never be higher than the economic structure of society and its cultural development condition thereby. So that means there can be higher standards of right. And my view, which you know is different from Alan Wood's view, is that there will be such a higher conception of right in, in Marx's view. But if it's going to be higher, we have to have a basis by which we can say it's higher, right? We can't say it's more just. We, I mean, we could, but for Marx, justice is historically situated. And that trans-historical basis, in my view, is human freedom and how much it's developed. You see, so if we okay. say that in the first stage, human freedom, according to Marx, is developed only to a tiny uh, degree, because we're, we haven't fully separated ourselves from nature, in his view, and we're submerged in the community. Under capitalism, the second stage, we are, you know, uh, developing our needs, unlike ever before, which is why Marx thinks the bourgeoisie is a revolutionary class, right? It, uh, it tears asunder all forms of fixed hierarchy. All that is solid melts into air. And then you have the third stage. And again, this is not teleological, it's conceptual. Right? To understand what a fully free association would entail presupposes that we've achieved political emancipation, the granting of rights, and we supersede it right? instead of trying to negate it. Right? And that, for, for us to understand that, that's why you know, I, I, I turn to Abgehoven, because there's just no other way of understanding that process and how it would unfold. And also for those interested, you know, there is, of course, the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, where he talks about the poetry of the future. And he says, you know, we should let the dead bury the dead. But the problem with that is there's always time for mourning. <laughs> there should right. be time for mourning. And we can't start our society, this emancipatory society, from scratch. We, he says even there, the, the weight of all dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the minds of the living. So how would that, you know, that's, that's part of what it means to be human, right? To live with the nightmares of the past, including the capitalist nightmares with which we are still living. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, but I'm, I guess I'm still wondering, you know, I, I don't, I know, I, I know I'm cognizant of the time here and stuff like that, but, but I, I am still a little bit curious about, you know, cause it, like how did, maybe this is a very like simpleton, like lib question, but you know, what's the, like the, is, is the thought that like, once we reach this higher level of human emancipation, then I guess what seems to me like the, like a tension between, I suppose, um, um, democracy and, liberalism or something like that or like rights right like is that just gonna somehow be a con like like no longer a problem because like i guess if 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 laws and rights are kind of somehow radically democratized which is kind of what it sounds like you're saying like this collective control then i guess there's always like the worry from uh from my perspective that like that that you know the reason we have laws is right it's like a, it's to temper uh, democratic when when democracy potentially goes wrong and that's probably like a very you know like lib lib pessimistic perspective but I guess so so would you say then that this depends on the human being transformed somehow right because like right now like with the human beings that exist in our society that risk seems really real and with what's happening right now like democracy going awry and but whereas like in this it's like it depends on some view that the human being is just transformed such that we're not worried about that anymore is that a mischaracterization I think it's part of the mis mischaracterization, but it has roots in the way that many Marxists have gone about trying to deal with this very complicated subject. So Pashukainis is a good example, because in place of the legal form, he wants to have technical regulation, and he assumes unity of social purpose. Right. So that just assumes away the problem, and I'm not convinced by that, and I think right. it's very dangerous. And here liberals may be right and when they say that it assumes a post-political society. In my book, what I end up saying is if we look very carefully and read what Marx writes in his famous 1859 preface you know, to the contribution of the critique of political economy, he talks about 
you know, the end of prehistory, but the beginning of conscious human history, not the end of history. This is an absurd view. I think that was foisted upon Marx and Marxism and also upon Hegel by Fukuyama, uh, who, who, in my view, never fully grasped even the Kojevian interpretation of the struggle yeah. for recognition. But that's just my own view. I think Fukuyama's current work is a lot more sophisticated. Uh, I would say so, yeah. Right? Yeah. And more historical in a sense than, than, than that very popular book, which came out, you know, at a very distinct time, right? Which, yeah, yeah. which, which is why it had such attraction, in my view, with respect to uh, Fukuyama. But even there, he, the beginning of conscious human history means now we don't have excuses. Now we're not the subject of alien powers and whims. Now we have to take responsibility for our actions and to determine our destinies, right? So th- that's the first evidence, in my view, against this idea of a post-political society. Another argument is in the capital, right, where he talks about the realm of human freedom blossoming, right? He talks about the associated producers rationally governing their interchange with nature. So that says something about, you know, the future of the environment, too, that there are rational and irrational ways of governing our interchange with nature. And then he says, in a manner worthy of their human nature. In other words, we can't produce any which way under communism. We have to produce in a manner that is worthy of, of our human nature as free beings. And so it's not possible to do that under capitalism because the game tells us that the only way of getting ahead is if we bring someone else down, right? And that, to bring it back to Peterson, right, you know, it's not about an evil capitalist. Capitalists are also alienated in a sense, certainly not as much as workers, uh, in that they have to compete in this game, right? They have to take advantage even if they don't want to. And if they're going to be nice capitalists, they're not going to survive for very long in the market, right? That's just an objective fact, if you will. So the point uh, I think, Just to interject there, I would say that actually he takes a very reactionary tact um, in these kind of respects because one of the characteristics of conservative, particularly uh, right-wing conservative uh, approaches is sympathy uh, for alienated people who happen to exist in positions of power, right? Uh, and a lot of the examples that he brings up uh, throughout his work are precisely about the fact that, well, if you think about how hard lawyers worked in order to get where they are, how hard it is to actually run a company, you should build sympathy for these individuals, imagine mm-hmm. what they've sacrificed, <laughs> and so on and so forth. Uh, and the emphasis is pretty telling, right? And it is kind of funny to think of what Marx would say, uh, worried to be writing about Jordan Peterson, right? Because I imagine <laughs> that his satire would be quite exquisite uh, to actually enjoy, right? Sure, sure. And the, the, what I would add, though, is what I tried to mention is the moralizing attitude, the reactionary moralizing attitude. But Marx, you know, moralizing was anathema to Marx, which is why, perhaps, you know, he didn't take it as seriously as he should have, the potentially, let's say, emancipatory role of talking about justice is he lived in a Victorian society. If someone would fall on a, uh, on a banana peel, the first thing they would say is an injustice has been done to me or it's an affront to my d- dignity. And, you, you know, there was a certain allergy towards this kind of language because it was used and abused not only by liberals, but by conservatives as, as well, right? And an abstract appeal to justice in a, you know, in a situation where there's vast inequality and domination. And so he says, for example, in the critique of the Code of, code of Program, uh, do not the, the, the bourgeoisie not think the present order is just? So what's the point of appealing to justice in the abstract? Because there is no way of adjudicating whose conception of justice really is just in a capitalist society where you know the law is organized in a certain way uh, to you know further the, the interests of one class over the other. Um, but Victor, I think I think the point is basically that it's not a post-political society. That's one thing that we cannot that that. Potential contradiction. So there would still be like institutions. <laughs> that well, that's somehow, my, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the place of law, in my view, is uh, is uh, as a mediating role to ensure that the freedom of each coheres with the freedom of all. In the absence of such an institution, even if you and I, for example, don't have conflicting interests, right? You're not exploiting me. I'm not exploiting you. But you wanna you wanna turn on your radio at uh, at midnight because you're yeah. a lover of music, and I wanna go to sleep. We need to figure out a way that we could work together so that you could pursue your aim and I can pursue mine. You see, it's a, this is a very simplistic... Get headphones. Yeah, get headphones <laughs> right? or whatever, right? This is just a simplistic mm-hmm. example that shows sure. how, how conflicts can emerge that are not bound up with you know, class antagonisms, right? Okay. We live in, in a society that's still defined by those antagonisms, but uh, the problem with the Pashukanists of the world is that they assume that problem away, and I don't want to. 
And even Engels, if you're curious about this, he did anticipate the question of what would happen in the communist societies in his speeches in Elberfield, which I cite in the book. He, and he, there he assumes, I think, is rather optimistic, that the vast majority of conflicts which emerge from, you know, private property and, you know, thefts, all these other things, civil, private right, by the way, <laughs> as opposed yeah. to public right, to bring it back to our dear formalists, uh, that still there'll be disagreements, but he thinks they'll easily be resolved by arbitrators. So you see, even okay. there we have evidence that there will be some institutional feature. And you look, they're sketching out a society that doesn't exist within the yeah, framework of, course, of, of course. the existing society. So even Engels, who, you know, is, is you know, they attributed uh, with the famous uh, you know, point about the withering away of the state. This is Engels saying that there'll still be conflicts, except they'll be solved by... Um, uh, arbitrators and what does it mean to be an arbitrator? Maybe you're not a professional like the, the way that Weber wanted it, you know, professional lawyers and separate yeah, associations sure. uh, drawn from the middle class or Hegel, civil servants, universal class. But you know, you need to have an impartial conception of justice that will allow you to adjudicate between competing claims, however rare those claims may be. And Engels allowed for the possibility that there will be such claims. So you see, okay. even the classics, right, to whom we impose and attribute these simplistic, you know, views, anticipated this and, you know, responded to it. It's just that they never were, had a worked out theory of law and right in the spirit of Hegel, of uh, Fichte, of Kant. But that doesn't mean we, we, we shouldn't take them seriously, you know, and, and assume those questions away. Engels didn't, in my view, and Marx didn't either. And, and we have to take them at their best, not at their worst. And that's good. No, that's really interesting. Yeah. Um... Maybe. Yeah. So, and, and I guess just like kind of jokingly, you know, so that means there'll be institutions. That means I can still uh, do my own thing and be a free rider. Well, that's and not go to meetings. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, every society, every society has its own mechanisms that it uses to get people on board. Capitalist sure, society sure, sure. has it, right? You know, let me give you an example. Uh, you know, think of the Protestant ethic in the spirit of capitalism. When we go to, uh, when we used to go to the, the pub or a restaurant, there is this informal, though nonetheless morally mandatory tipping system, which in some sure. sense, you know, doesn't actually contribute to the improvement of the condition of the working class. It makes them ever more dependent, right? Yeah. And yet somehow we feel compelled to pay the tips because we know that the workers aren't getting paid very well. Where does this come from? So that's an informal mechanism that's used by a certain system to get right, consumers right, right. to pay twice. So instead of getting employers to pay better wages or to legislate that, you know, th through the government, right, we end up somehow paying because we feel guilty to use Nietzsche again, yeah. that conscience. Well, the good, the good ones of us pay. <laughs> Yeah, but it's rare. It's rare. The good ones. Because again, I'm not going to moral. Well, it's funny. I think it's also our generation more, though. You'd be surprised. Like, I know a lot of friends who are servers, right? And it's like older people sometimes like are way more common to not tip. And it's yeah, cultural. It's cultural as well. Like, in you know, in the UK, for example, in the Japan. Yeah, they don't tip. In, in Japan, it's interpreted as an affront to one's dignity. <laughs> yeah. To, right. to some extent, right? Which also should, you know, alert us, right? That yeah. there are different mechanisms that are used to achieve, let's say, uh, social goals. Right. Sure. Um, and th there's no reason why you know we can't get you to avoid free riding by ostracizing you, for example, yeah, in yeah, ancient yeah, no, Greek sure. way. So <laughs> that's a rejoinder to your joke. Okay. Good. Okay. So I know we're like running out of time here. So just briefly, maybe like in the last like little bit, we can briefly talk about kind of like the online landscape of leftists, if you don't mind. Like just the reaction. Obviously, Matt, you wrote an article not too long ago defending some like the compatibility between socialism and liberal rights. And of course the review of Igor's book now did get some predictable reactions of, from tankies, I suppose you could say, and other people who just have this very, very strong hostility to, to, to rights. And I don't know, Matt, if you want to speak to that quickly or, or if Igor, you had any opinions about just like the, the, the sort of landscape of leftism online and hostility and own like, um, no, like libs. And I don't I, know. There's I think like, that there's this propensity and some left wing circles to assume that, the most radical outlook uh, is the one that's best, right? Uh, and my kind of counter to that is if you genuinely want to be a radical, you need to be a radical in the authentic sense of the word, uh, you know, because the Latin it for radical is radix, uh, which means rooted. Uh, and I think this is why Marx's critique has borne out a lot better uh, than the critiques of a lot of other utopian socialists, because he had a dialectical approach uh, to society rather than just saying everything is bad and we need to do away with it and replace it with this, right? 
Uh, and the reason why I'm very critical of a lot of socialists um, and leftists who say we just need to do away with liberalism is precisely because it's not a very dialectical approach, right? Uh, it doesn't recognize that liberalism is a historically situated ideology uh, with a certain material base. And if we're going to overcome its limitations, that we need to actually first understand them and recognize that any society that we're going to build on top of it uh, is inevitably going to be, as uh, Igor pointed out, stamped. Uh, with the influence of this doctrine and this particular way of doing things, right? Uh, and a truly radical critique not, doesn't, ju doesn't just recognize that, uh, but it also acknowledges that there are certain features of the old society that we're going to want to keep, uh, both for normative and for historical reasons, in the uh, better epoch to come, right? Uh, and this is just why I get frustrated, <laughs> right? And it's like uh, it's kind of a drive for purity. It's like this this strange. There's like a, there's an interesting psychological mechanism. I feel like that you could read through like Lacan or something like that. That like you know there's, it's this kind of like wanting this this oppositional thinking to be like well everything that's associated with that is bad and I just want to like take and 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 establish this pure moral high ground in a sense. Well, the ironic thing is, uh, I think that a lot of these, this mentality owes a lot more to Nietzsche than it does to, uh, to somebody like Marx, right? Because there's this propensity to think that uh, the established order as it is, is bad um, because I didn't create it. Uh, and therefore, a radical critique or an ever more radical critique, as it's sometimes put, uh, involves trashing everything about the, established, the status quo and suggesting how we're going to utterly replace it with something different, right? Yeah. Uh, and we've seen the impotence uh, of these kinds of critiques for decades now, uh, where people put forward ever more radical uh, critiques of the status quo, uh, hypothesizing about speculative futures that will never come, uh, and none of it really amounts to anything, right? Uh, and I think one of the reasons that Marx's thinking has resonated with people for such a long time is precisely because a dialectical approach genuinely is radical, uh, in the sense that it historically situates the time period in which we live and showcases how it is that we might move away from that uh, in a way that seems realistic and plausible. Uh, and that to me is a lot more radical than just sitting there saying, we need to burn down the old to build the new. Uh, and I think that a lot of progressives really need to wean themselves off uh, of this kind of utopian um, mode of thinking about things. Including yeah, Igor, do you have thoughts? Yeah, Igor, do you have thoughts about like the landscape now? Sorry, of, I know that was a little rain, but I feel quite strongly yeah. about that. Well, yeah. one, one minor quibble with Matt about Nietzsche, because I have a soft spot for Nietzsche, notwithstanding my own political proclivities and interest in Marx, is that even he recognizes in the genealogy of morals that without slave morality, human beings wouldn't have yeah. depth. <laughs> That's so, true. Now, his solution, of course, the, the new the revaluation of all values and uh, new mass. Master morality, the future philosophers, I don't find very helpful or, for that matter, very practical. Uh, so that's or another appealing. point. But e yeah. or appealing, yeah, on normative, on normative grounds. Although a case could be made and has been made that Zarathustra descends uh, from the mountains in order to show, you know, the abyss and to to kind sure, of reignite yeah. the. That's a very, you could say, <laughs> minority reading of that yeah, yeah, Zarathustra. Yeah. But in any case. In the genealogy of morals, I think he does sketch out kind of a more historical genealogical approach of how, you know, uh, slave morality did become dominant. The, the then I think the challenge for Marx is to engage with Nietzsche is to say, well, actually, we need a new <laughs> slave morality uh, that will right. actually be more <laughs> consistent and less hypocritical because Nietzsche Oops. and Marx were both criti uh, critics of modernity in a sense as well. And of course, dialectics of uh, suspicion or whatever. Or no, uh, yeah, is that what they call it? Hermeneutics of suspicion, that's it, yeah. Right. Uh, I think, you know, Matt obviously has more experience with these, this online uh, environment than I do. I'm new to it, but I've, I've encountered it in person, right? Yeah, of And course. I think the best way, at least when we are in, in settings where people are willing to listen and engage in debate and dialogue, and it has occurred to once I was involved and gave presentations for the Marx and Philosophy Society in the UK, and we would have activists as well as, you know, academics. And I gave this point criticizing Pashakanis. And then I had this chance, why are you so big on rights? And I said, you know, kind of, why must we have rights? And so on, this mm -hmm. seems rather foreign. And I said, well, what will you have in its place? And then the individual in question said, it's not a fair question. I'm like, it is a fair question because you're, <laughs> you're posing this question to me and I at least offer something in the way of an answer. I think we have to once, I mean, we have to take criticism seriously, but then we have to challenge the people who are criticizing to provide a better alternative. Because yeah. in some sense, that shows that we actually respect and are listening to what they're saying. That's a certain point, right? You can't do that. Um, 
when it's ad hominem and nothing more than that. I've also experienced that. I was actually called a tanky recently. I had to look up <laughs> what that meant because, you know, it has, this is, this is the point about kind of invoking terms out of context, right? Uh, so uh, thank you. I, w- I was called a potential uh, follower of, uh, of the Straussian uh, and also a Trotskyist at the same time, uh, <laughs> which led to a various humorous and uplifting moments for me. Uh, as I, you know, teaching many courses. So, you know, I think past a certain point, if it's simply ad hominem, there's no point in engaging with that. But for those of us who are committed to a better world, right, and also like me and having been born in the former Soviet Union, we have a responsibility, you know, to learn from the past. We're talking about human lives here. So I'll just repeat, you know, the point that I made earlier about Pashukhanis. For him, the legal theory was a question of life and death. We have to, we don't have to recreate you know, his, the conditions in do, under which he lived. Certainly we don't want to do that. But we have to learn from the mistakes of the past. And when we continue to theorize about, you know, societies uh, that won't have room for conflicts, where everyone will agree, right? Well, there'll be unity of social purpose. And while at the same time, simply dumping in a one-sided way on the achievements, many of which, by the way, right, Came, up, came about as a result of people on the left fighting for civil liberties. Rights didn't fall from the sky. So when people dump on rights, particularly, I'm not talking about the economic rights in particular, by economic rights, you know, contractual rights and freedom of sure. contract, but call them positive or socioeconomic rights as well. People, those individuals are dumping on the legacy and the contributions of those who fought for those things when they didn't exist, which is why I spend a lot of time in the book, actually, paying attention to specifically those conditions or those situations when rights were at stake and what Marx had to say about them. On the Jewish question was partially inspired because Marx was approached by uh, the leadership, the delegation of the Rhineland Jewish community, asking him to endorse a petition in favor of rights, equal rights for the Jews. And he says, I'll do it. I don't like, you know, organized religion or Judaism, but we have to punch as many holes as possible in in the Prussian state and introduce, right, as many rational views as we can. What are those rational views? The defense of equal rights for the Jewish community. That's one case. The next case is the 1848 revolutions, right, where Marx was actually involved in that revolution and returned to Cologne and was tried. Uh, was tried for uh, treason and, and tax refusal, right? Because uh, of the illegitimacy of the reactionary state that came to, to... So when that question emerges, where did Marx sta- stand with respect to rights? When the rights were actually at stake, it's absolutely clear where he stood. He stood in defense of civil rights and liberties. No one pays attention to that. All we remember from on the Jewish question mostly is an anti-Semitic diatribe, apparently, which nonetheless was meant to... <laughs> defend the, the rights of Jews. I'm not, you know, right. I'm not, I'm not uh, apologizing for Marx's language. I think it was sure. quite irresponsible, particularly the second essay, especially if we read it in the, you know, in the aftermath of the Holocaust and so on. But we can't blame Marx for everything, you know. Yeah. Uh, it, but it was, it, it's, it was irresponsible uh, from our present standpoint and what we know about what happened. Uh, so I want to make, make that point. And then finally, right, uh, the reactionary waves, the fact that Marx was always a critic of the autocratic, authoritarian and Prussian state, right? We tend to forget about that, right? And uh, we shouldn't, because that's what makes Marx so relevant to the 21st century, because we're seeing a relapse of that. And this is where I think uh, those who are committed to the idea that the free development of each is a condition for the free development of all should join forces in order to fight for those things that are worthy of safeguarding, protecting, and ultimately expanding. And we can't do that unless, you know, we work together to defend the things that have been accomplished, achieved by many members, uh, you know, of of the left, including the working class. Uh, And it's silly to think that we should simply dump on something without which Engels and Marx say a working working class movement is just not possible without freedom of expression, assembly, association. You see that in Luxembourg's work as well, which I don't discuss in the book. So, you know, the fact of the matter is, you know, we are liberated from the experience and the tragedy and the accomplishments of the Soviet Union. Because, again, I don't see it in a one-sided way. Uh, You know, there were many gains made in the early years of the Russian Revolution, radically liberal, one could say. Uh, But, you know, it just shows the complexity of what it means to try and work towards realizing a new standard of right beyond the narrow horizon of bourgeois right. 
So, you know, the ultimate point, interpretive point, is that beyond the narrow horizon, there's a broader horizon, not no horizon as such. That, right. That's what I'd say. Good. I think that's a great place to end. Uh, Igor, thanks so much. The book is Revisiting Marx's Critique of Liberalism, Rethinking Justice, Legality, and Rights from Palgrave Macmillan. It's a good book. And uh, thanks. Thanks. I think we can stop recording now. Right.